His areas of expertise include marketing and innovation, uh, first mover advantages, business, business model innovations. Mr. Sammy, can you please come up? Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here to present, uh, talk about uh, high sourcing economy. Uh, I'd like to discuss about the matter of uh, how to scale up hydrogen economy. You know, so far I learned that uh, uh, the hydrogen technology has been proved. This proved technology is already commercialized. The thing is how we could scale up. I think there are three key players uh, to make this happen. Uh, industry investors and policy makers. I'd like to see how many of you are or you're working for uh, policy or government sector. Would you please raise your hands? Good, a lot, thank you. How many of you work for in investment or banking? Raise your hand. Oh, <laughs> that's fine. Okay, uh, how many of you work for industry? Raise your hand. A lot too. Uh, anybody hasn't raised your hand? <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> I do not work for industry. I do not work for banking. I do not work for government or policy sector. But anyway, I'm here to play a key role uh, to scale up a high growth in the economy. Even though they have really different perspectives, different interests. Uh, you know, they have to work together, make this happen. Today's talk, you know, my topic is uh, whether, the first question is, uh, will it take off? What I'm saying is, if uh, whether hybrid technology will take off. What I'm saying is, that some technologies need to take off. Once we find this timing of takeoff, then it flies, demand explodes. The government doesn't need to support anymore. I think you know, we want to find whether it is coming, and if it comes, and when it comes. That's the topic of today's talk. Uh, first, you know, I'd like to go over some literature, you know, how the others think. And I'm going to introduce some theory. Actually, you know, my background is marketing, but uh, my expert is in innovation marketing. So I'm going to uh, introduce some kind of so theory could be applied to predicting uh, when will take off. And then I'm going to share you know, my thoughts about what will happen. First, uh, there are seven areas. This is uh, presented by McKinsey Report uh, 2017. They identify seven areas of high growth and economy. I think you could read it. Uh, this is available. The title of this, uh, this article is Hydrogen, the next way for electronic vehicles. This is a really good summary of what's going to happen. You know, basically, uh, if you look at this, there are a big two parts. Hydrogen could enable the renewable energy system. The key word is hydrogen should work with renewable energy sources. I'm going to a little bit elaborate this, this thing later when I uh, share my thought about future of hydrogen technology. The second is, of course, once we develop a lot of uh, hydrogen with the integration of high, uh, new renewable technology, renewable energy sources, and we're going to change the world. What I'm saying is decarbonization. We have to decarbonize the end user's consumption of energy. There are several areas, you know, transportation, industry, energy use, and heat and power. You know, by the way, the key difference, there are so many differences between battery power and electric power versus hydrogen. One of the, the key differences you know, it is uh, hydrogen produces both electricity as well as heat. So that's why this is really good. Uh, Area, you know, we could decarbonize building heat and power. Anyway, and uh, based on according to the High Jerusalem Council, this council was first uh, uh, organized. It was uh, founded in uh, 2017, January, and uh, they have uh, they the participating members include 
many of our automobile manufacturers as well as energy uh, producers. And they uh, envision 2050 what's going to happen. What they say is, in order to develop economy, hydrogen economy, uh, we need investment. By the way, as I have told in this you know, earlier, uh, we, we need uh, investors. We need a lot of investors. They, uh, they say, in order to make this happen, what I'm saying is to make this uh, hydrogen economy take off, we need to invest $280 billion in next 11, next, until 2030. Then how much, where do we want to spend? Their recommendation is about 70%. What I'm saying is 70% should be 40% hydrogen, production of hydrogen, and 30% storage, transport, and distribution. Most of funding should go to production, and storage, and transport, uh, the transportation and distribution of hydrogen. And remaining about 20%, uh, 25%, would go to product development and scale up manufacturing. And maybe, you know, 5% would go to new business model development. We need a new ventures who could uh, revolutionize, who could help the, the increase the demand of hydrogen economy. I need a time ticket. <laughs> and also, you know, they uh, provided a, you know, when will take off? What I hear their report, when you look at this, their, their report, they say in some of sectors, as of 2017, and it's already commercialized. But when will the product will be acceptable to the market? But, uh, as you can see, it takes time. It takes 10 years. So by 2030, most of applications, most of areas will accept that hydrogen is the source, a major source of energy. And also they projected the size of the market, potential market size. Okay, this is a summary of uh, what people say. I would say, you know, Hydrogen Council, which are incumbent of uh, stakeholders of hydrogen technology, uh, very, I would say, optimistic. But, you know, would it happen? This is a question now. Uh, I think I see, uh, I view, hydrogen technology as a disruptive innovation. The notion of disruptive innovation is uh, when the technology was introduced, it underperforms. One of the examples is uh, internal combustion engine. It's, as time goes by, the technology performance increase improves over time. But uh, this trajectory is limited. But new technology, typically it underperforms. Uh, one of the examples is electric vehicle, battery-based electric vehicle. When it first introduced, it underperformed. But as time goes by, it meet the point that the performance is equivalent to the performance of mainstream customers would pay for. I would say, in an electric vehicle, battery-based electric vehicle, will have this, it will take off only 2020. In my perspective, I think that California already has taken off. But what I'm saying is in the nationwide, in the United States, it will take off early 2020. The question to this talk is the, the following question. Will fuel cell EV ever take off? Uh, gosh, this is a scary question. But anyway, some of technologies never take off. So the question is, whether will it take off? If so, why it takes off? And maybe you know, the third question is, you know, beyond the scope of today's talk, will fuel cell uh, EV become the dominant solution? Uh, unlikely until 2050. Uh, this is what I mean. So maybe this timing will be beyond 2050. But anyway, we'll see. The one thing we have, you should notice is this is small. It is different across different type of technologies. 
that probably all the technologies is doesn't, even though you pump poor money, uh, it doesn't increase, it doesn't improve. But new technology probably improves as, as we pump in money. Uh, question, will it take off? I think this is a matter of crossing the chase. Any new technology has innovators. What I'm saying is people adopt new things. This is about roughly 2.5%. They, regardless of economic benefit or uh, cost, they adopt it. So you know, new technology, if they really push hard, you could sell, you know, we could sell 2.5, you could take 2.5% of market share. But only the other are different people. They are different. Why are different? They are not innovators. They adopt because they know it and they, because they see the benefit, because this one works for them. Now, you know, after you serve, if you do not serve with early adopters, you cannot make mainstream customers adopt. So if I you know, apply this concept to electric vehicle and fuel cell uh, electric vehicle industry, what's the matter? This is my question now. So would it force? Would it really force this change? So we need to identify these early adopters and focus on satisfying them. Because before we serve mainstream customers, we have to identify this. So you know, the, this 15%, if you some of these two is up roughly 16%. Once we hit 16% of market potential, the demand explored. The you know, government doesn't have to support anymore because it flies high. And actually, the manufacturer will have more competitive entries. And you know, the, the, the better is how to meet the excessive demand. That's a good question to think about. Now, I have a, I, I think, you know, if I if you ask, will it take off? And I will say, yes, it will take off. There are two reasons I think, you know, why it will take off. The first reason is solar and wind. You know, solar and wind will expand. We need a clean average. They, uh, by 2050, 50% 50 of 50% uh, of electricity will be produced by renewable energy sources. And most of them will be either solar or wind. Why do I say this? The reason I'm saying this is, like this. You know, I visited uh, uh, Copenhagen, uh, Denmark, a couple of years ago. What I noticed is, uh, at the time when I visited, I realized that the, they produce uh, more than enough of electricity through their windmills. But what they say is 50% of their electricity is uh, supplied by windmill. But time to time, they produce more than 140% of the, the, the demand. So what I'm saying is they have about you know, the, 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 the more than half, more than double of electricity is available. It happens a lot. And then what do they do? They export. But uh, it's the export of this energy is limited. They can't. They should do its export through grid. And, uh, and the Germany, they, they say that I don't need it, then they have to waste this generated renewable sources. That's what I'm thinking about. It. As time goes by, especially in California, we wanted to achieve more re re renewable energy sources. But the matter is, you know, battery system is limited. This energy storage system is limited. What I'm saying is, battery only store temporarily, I'll say short term, a couple of days at best. And battery can save this energy and then use it through grid. Without grid, it cannot export, it cannot transmit to other places. But hydrogen has very unique characteristics. It can store. Hydrogen is, is this technology is scalable, meaning you could make a bigger tank. This is scalable. But anyway, it takes time. It takes, you know, uh, people say within a decade. 
will have a magnificent way of collecting electricity and transform to uh, hydrogen and then distribute it. And it's going to happen because we have excessive renewable energy sources. If you do not use it, and we just waste it. Uh, that kind of thing is hydrogen. Hydrogen will take off because there is a demand. I don't see there is a, a competition between electric battery based electric vehicle versus hydrogen electric vehicle. They complement. They are complement. The reason I'm saying this is some people who really want to have zero emission vehicle cannot buy electric vehicle because of several reasons. They don't have a charging. They, have, they don't have no access to home charging and office charging. Who are they? There are many, by the way, in the United States. If you own your house, you have one uh, single uh, detention house, then you're fine. But if you live in multi-units, if you live in downtown and uh, you have to share your, uh, your parking lots, then where would you like to charge? This is the product. And you know, you know that you know, the electric vehicle can go long, and the hydrogen have high density. So if you need a high output, then the electric vehicle cannot handle it. So what I see is this market is segmented and they're complementing one another. I roughly estimate you know, multi-unit dwellers in the United States is 33%. About you know, 70, uh, 67 percent of the United people uh, in the United States live in uh, single housing. So this 33 percent never gonna buy. Uh, well, I'm, I'm saying they're gonna buy it, but if the electric vehicle market expands, some many of them will feel uncomfortable in convenient. Then they have to find something else, which is hopefully hydrogen. But, but the matter is, a lot of problems, you know, refueling stations, and so on. So we, I expect, uh, this is my conclusion. This is last slide. This is last slide. I'm going to read it. And if you have any question, you know, please ask a question about this. I will answer to this, one of these questions. Question, hydrogen economy, when will it take off? It is when the cost of renewable hydrogen drops. By the way, I learned today that you know, you know, renewable hydrogen can be called green hydrogen. Green hydrogen. And uh, drops to the level of large scale fossil fuel synthesized hydrogen. I learned that uh, this is called green hydrogen. And second point, fuel cell EV market will take off by 2030 first in the regions where EVs are highly penetrated and renewables are highly adopted. Third point, the market share potential of pure cell EV in US will be one third, I just say conservatively one third. Okay, one third. Instead of giving percentage, I'll say one third of EV market by 2050. The reason I'm saying this is again, this is not, they are not viable, of course, and they are not substitute, they are complement. Industrial and commercial transportation will adopt hydrogen aggressively as the decarbonation pressure increases with incentives. I have to divide this the test with a lot of incentives. More than 50% of gas stations will be closed by 2050, and some of them uh, can be transformed to hydrogen refueling stations. And because of uh, it's high energy density, high person might be a winner for people. Victor is vertical takeoff and landing. This is a uh, conclusion of my talk. We'll take questions after. I've never met anyone with so much passion in hydrogen. <laughs> uh, when I met him in the morning, he was very calm and stoic, but when he approached the stage, he was very lively. You certainly sold us on hydrogen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Smith. Next speaker uh, is Mr. Mike O'Brien. He's the Vice President of Product, Corporate, and Digital Planning at Hyundai Motor America. He's a 30-year industry veteran and is responsible for guiding strategic development of Hyundai's entire line lineup, including cars and crossovers. 
identifying opportunities to expand to new segments and tailoring Hyundai vehicles for the U.S. market. Mr. O'Brien, please come up. Thank you. Why don't we uh, welcome with Ronald Cross. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So, Professor Min has made it very easy for me. And uh, we can take orders for the next up at the end of the session. So all of you get your wallets out. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about today about what Hyundai is up to. But a little background on myself. I've been uh, working uh, for Hyundai for a number of years, and I've been working very hard in the area of advanced technologies, particularly powertrain. I used to work at Toyota for almost 14 years in a similar area working in advanced powertrain technologies as well. So uh, a little bit of background in this area. Uh, when you think about what's going on right now, uh, it's really an amazing time, probably the most transformative time in the auto industry since the invention of the car. When you think about all the mega trends that are converging on transportation today, so everything is changing very rapidly. Think about it just for a minute. Uber incorporated 10 years ago. Just 10, everybody thinks about Uber as it's been around forever, right? 10 years ago, Ubers didn't exist. In fact, after they incorporated, it's quite a while before the first Uber ride was available to a consumer. So in just less than a decade, there's been tremendous transformation. When you think about it, uh, we're now moving towards autonomy. We already have cars that are quite capable. Uh, we have connectivity we never imagined before. In fact, uh, we're going to launch a car uh, called a Sonata in just a few months. It's going to be the first non-luxury car that will have your phone as a key. So everybody here with a mobile phone, that'll be your key in the future. And in fact, you'll be able to pass your, uh, your password on to anybody you wish, uh, your, your, uh, your friends, your relatives. And if they upset you, you can disable their phone so they can't get in your car just as quickly. So we're going to have that feature now that will obsolete the key. And it'll allow new connectivity with, uh, with the area around you. So your car is going to be the central uh, aspect of your connectivity. Uh, when you think about zero emissions, we have so many products we'll talk about in a minute that will offer near or zero emission performance. And then mobility as a service. So all this connectivity, whether it's dedicated short-range communication, 5G communication, all of these things that are now becoming uh, ubiquitous to the car uh, will allow uh, cars to do so much more, whether it's ride hailing, ride sharing, car sharing, all these things are quickly being enabled by the car and the connectivity that the car uh, is, enables. So a lot going on. So when you think about uh, powertrain strategy, uh, for us, uh, we're continuing to develop uh, our powertrains, both uh, gasoline and diesel. So those are very, very mature technologies. And so now there's very small incremental improvements. A little bit of weight reduction, a little bit of uh, uh, improvement in efficiency. So right now, the best and most efficient gasoline engine is about 40%. That means that 40% of the energy in comes out as traction force to the drive the car down the road. Uh, but beyond that, we have much higher efficiencies with these other technologies like hydrogen. Uh, so we're continuing to develop here, but it's again very mature and it's very small improvements. In the future, we're looking at better hybrid systems. So that's combining uh, fossil fuel with electrification to get the best of both worlds. The miracle of hybridization is that we can uh, have a much smaller uh, uh, petroleum engine because uh, by making it smaller, it runs at its more efficient range. Engines are most efficient in full throttle, believe it or not. That's when they do the best job of converting a petroleum product into traction force. And when you have a big engine, it's very inefficient. A small engine is more efficient. So with a hybrid, you have a real small engine with an electric motor that assists and helps the car go with the gasoline engine or diesel. Uh, but what's the other miracle of hybridization is whenever I push the brake pedal on a gasoline conventional car, all that energy you just spent to make the car go, now you're turning the heat energy it's going up in the atmosphere, it's useless. So with a hybrid, I recapture all that braking energy when I push the brake pedal. I grab it back and I shove it back in the batteries. So now I get to use it again. So there's these two miracles of hybridization that will allow us to extend the use of fossil fuels for a little bit longer. But then beyond that, pure battery electric vehicles and of course uh, hydrogen vehicles that we'll talk a lot about today. And both have advantages and disadvantages. So when you think about it, battery electric vehicles are quite ideal for very small and medium-sized vehicles because we have the issue of storing electricity, which is unique with the battery.
better than the people we store in. And so if we want to go faster, we want to have a bigger vehicle, we want to tow something or carry a payload, we have to have a lot more batteries. When I have a lot more batteries, it takes a lot longer time to store than to charge them, and it also costs a lot more money. It's basically a log function improvement or an increase in cost, so much more expensive. So as you get into bigger vehicle classes, all of a sudden hydrogen becomes a clear winner. So hydrogen has all the same properties and characteristics as those mentioned in terms of the size of the powertrain, the size of the energy storage area, the fuel tanks, and the characteristics in terms of power and refueling time basically match uh, a conventional petroleum product. So uh, we're better electric vehicles to do a fabulous job on smaller class vehicles. Hydrogen uniquely has the ability to satisfy both small and large vehicles. So if you think about it in terms of California's goal to uh, basically eliminate carbon from our mobile sources uh, by 2050, uh, that can only truly be done with hydrogen today. That's the only known technology that would displace every motor vehicle type on the road today. Battery electric will do a great job on smaller vehicles, but on bigger vehicles, the hydrogen can, can, uh, can replace all of those uh, commercial vehicles and do a great job on smaller vehicles as well, as you see with better, better products that are out there today. So right now, you can look at our lineup. We have uh, several hybrids. We have Ionic, Sonata, a hybrid. Uh, Ionic is the first product that offers three powertrain choices to consumers. They can have a battery electric vehicle, a hybrid vehicle, or a plug-in hybrid vehicle in the same body type. Uh, we also offer plug-in hybrids and Ionic and Sonata plug-in hybrids. Uh, for people that are just getting into a uh, near zero emission vehicle, they're a great choice because it has the same range of conventional vehicle. In our case, uh, between five and 600 mile range for our plug-in hybrids. So it allows you on a short commute to be fully uh, zero emission. Uh, typically with a normal commute, they're fully zero emission. But if I want to take a long road trip or go visit my family or friends, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles away, I can do it. Uh, and then of course we have a pure battery electric vehicle vehicles with Ionic and our Kona. Uh, Kona Electric uh, won the North American SUV of the Year Award this year. So it's a, an incredible vehicle. It has more range than the Tesla Model 3. Uh, it's an SUV, which what customers are looking for today. Uh, and of course, uh, we also have the Nexo that you'll be able to drive today. And we'll talk about it more as we get into this. So when you think about capability and cost, uh, Battery electric vehicles are now, uh, battery prices are coming down. Eventually, they'll approach, though, the cost of lithium. And so you, there's no scale that's going to reduce the uh, raw material cost. So uh, battery prices at some point will start plateauing because the efficiency of large-scale battery production will start approaching that of the raw material cost itself. Uh, and so you can see here this chart that, uh, for again, uh, when you're looking at uh, lower range vehicles, uh, battery, Quite competitive and passenger vehicles, but when you get into commercial vehicles, hydrogen has a clear cost advantage. There's no doubt about it. And particularly, the more capability and the more range you're looking for, the cost advantage of hydrogen becomes larger and larger. So that's when you're thinking about large commercial vehicles, over the road vehicles, uh, buses, uh, trains, those are the kinds of vehicles that really will benefit from hydrogen, both the cost and performance. And as many people have spoken today, uh, hydrogen is gonna serve a very vital role in our economy in the future. Think about it for a minute. You know, everybody talks about energy independence. Uh, every country worries about energy independence. Uh, with hydrogen, it would be a completely homegrown fuel. We'd make all of it here. We wouldn't import it. We wouldn't buy it from another country. We wouldn't have to worry about political instability. Uh, and so, as many others have mentioned also, it's an ideal way to store uh, grid energy. So unlike batteries, uh, I can store it forever, I can sell it to other people, I can move it around, and it has unlimited capability. So when you think about uh, the capital investment of uh, grid uh, electricity generation, uh, they have to capitalize for that one day in August when everybody has their air conditioner on. Wouldn't it be much better if you could store electricity as uh, hydrogen and therefore have lower capitalized expense for energy, uh, electrical energy production, and therefore have lower energy costs for all of us. So not only commercial vehicles, you can see at the top uh, right, but also 
terms of grid storage, it's really an ideal uh, medium for doing that, in addition to the vehicles that we're talking about. So when you look at our history in this game, uh, we've been doing this since 1998. So we started in 1998, so that's quite a, almost 21 years ago, we've been working on hydrogen mobility. Uh, we had a partner early on, uh, and uh, in 2004, we went off on our own. And we decided we're gonna dedicate an engineering center, an area called Mabu, where we uh, have dedicated fuel cell development and hydrogen uh, infrastructure and storage development as well. And so back in 2004, we went, we went rogue, we went independent, and we've been working on this ever since independently. So we've offered uh, two generations of uh, a mass-produced fuel cell vehicle, the first one in 2013, the, uh, the Tucson, and then the second one in uh, 2018. And along that way, we won a few awards, we'll talk about those later, but uh, they've been quite remarkable products for us. When you think about the first fuel cell, the uh, Tucson, we first uh, commercialized in 2013. It went on sale, I believe in June of 2015 here in the US. Uh, immediately it won uh, the awards, 10 best engine award. So that's the most prestigious technology award for uh, vehicle powertrain in the United States. And that is against all these advanced gasoline engines, all these performance engines, advanced diesel, and other battery electric powertrain as well. So the first year we were on the market with that product, we wore it the awards that best. And you can see around the world, it won a number of awards in Belgium, South Korea, and in France. Uh, so it, it added up quite a few uh, recognized uh, leadership areas in terms of uh, performance and uh, range and so forth. Now this was a 100 kilowatt fuel cell stack. 100 kilowatt motor. So it had modest performance, which is very competitive, certainly not high performance. So then the Nexo came along in 2018. Uh, this vehicle now has raised the efficiency bar up to 60%. So it's among the most efficient vehicles available today. As I told you before, or mentioned before, uh, gasoline's maxed out at 40% right now. So this is far more efficient than a gasoline or a diesel vehicle. Uh, we've expanded this capability. One of the limitations of early fuel cell, old ones, uh, going back several generations, was cold weather performance. Now we more than exceed cold weather performance compared to gasoline or diesel. So now these cars are fully capable if you look at Anchorage, Alaska, or anywhere else where you experience this early cold weather. And you may have read or heard that uh, this current state of battery technology and the known future of battery technology has severe limitations when the weather gets cold. So you can imagine if you're in Boston on a January morning, your vehicle can lose more than 40% of its charge if you have a battery electric vehicle. That's why the fully charged batteries are less than 40% uh, sometimes when it's cold. So uh, we don't have that thing, that same situation here. And as I mentioned earlier, a number of awards, uh, right out of the gate, we won the 2019 awards, 10 best engine award. That's the second time we won it for a fuel cell vehicle. Uh, this Consumer Electronics Show Editor's Choice Award, Consumer Electronics Show Top Tech winner, uh, and it's with a lot of advanced uh, capability. We designed this car to have capability that even our Genesis model do not have. So it has autonomous driving capability, it has self-parking capability, lane following assist capability. So it's got a tremendous amount of what's called ADAS, or Advanced Safety System Technology, built into this car. We want to eliminate any reason that someone would say, I'm not sure I'm gonna buy that car. And we made it an SUV, which is of course the preferred body type now, so we would be able to really offer something that would be a product that can directly replace a combustion vehicle in a consumer's garage. And you can see here in the middle, we offered a 100,000 model warranty. One of the big things that we've been able to achieve after several generations of stack development is now we're at a point where our performance and durability is the same as our gasoline models, meaning the lifetime of the stack last a comparable uh, length as a gasoline vehicle. So when you compare our old 2013 Tucson fuel cell, we started selling here in 2015, to the next zone, you can see we've done a number of things to improve it. Uh, one of the big areas when you think about R&D is uh, generations of R&D management. So in the beginning, we invent something. And then we decide, is it applicable to a vehicle? And then once we make it applicable to a vehicle, 2013 Tucson, then the big focus is manufacturability and cost reduction. 
and that takes two or three more generations. And we're in that stage right now with fuel cell. We're in the stage now, we know how to make them, we know how to make them durable, we know how to make them perform, and now we're at that last stage where we're now we're appealing cost reduction, we're removing cost out of the vehicle, and that's the final frontier for hydrogen for us right now. So you can see the power of 20%, the efficiency of 5%, uh, power density of 50%, uh, we've cut uh, moving part weight, powertrain weight by 14%. And we've cut the size of the powertrain down by uh, 18%. And we've done that with a number of interesting technologies. We use a very small battery, just as a buffer battery, meaning we're able to make the powertrain smaller but still provide 161 horsepower for having a little battery so we don't have a much bigger fuel cell that's more costly. We can cut costs and still have 161 horsepower in the wheels. So, uh, uh, we've increased its range with uh, more efficiency plus a little <coughs> tank size. And we've gone to a three tank system, not because we like to have more tanks, but because it allows us to have a very large uh, passenger and cargo cabin. We have a cargo space of almost 30 cubic feet, so it's very competitive with any uh, SUV out there in this size class. So there's no compromise in terms of uh, cargo carrying or passenger carrying capability. And it has a fuel economy of 61 uh, gasoline FPG. So outstanding uh, in terms of fuel economy. When you think about other aspects of hydrogen, one of the things we have to do with hydrogen is purify the air before it goes into the stack. Well, guess what? That benefits everybody. So when you think about it, the air that we purify to go into the stack before it, it's converted into electricity uh, is now will take care of 49, actually we'll just round it to 50. So for every hour I drive an Exo, I provide enough clean, pure oxygen for 50 people to, uh, to inhale for that same period of time, uh, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and also, when you think about it, so two diesel commercial vehicles produce enough uh, particulate matter that's completely offset by the operation of the next one for the same distance. So if I'm pacing two over-the-road diesels next to me on the 405 freeway, I'm canceling their particulate emissions by driving my next one. I'm actually cleaning their dirty air. So that's quite remarkable when you think about it. Uh, when you compare the various fuel cell vehicles out there, there's a number of choices now. Of course, we're very proud of ours, but there's some good choices out there. Uh, our old Tucson fuel cell had a driving range of 265 miles. Of course, that jumped up to 380 for the next up. The highest range zero emission vehicle available in the world today is the next up. Number two is the uh, Model S Tesla. Just at number two. Uh, I think it's now at the 360. So the uh, Verizon 312 for their hydrogen vehicle, the Clarity is the 366. So clearly, range is not a reason to reject hydrogen nowadays. Uh, driving performance, uh, as again, I mentioned that we went from 134 horsepower uh, with the old Tucson fuel cell. Now we're up to 161. That's very competitive. So if you look at a uh, a similar class size gasoline SUV, that horsepower is right in the middle of its range, a very competitive uh, power level. Uh, and we have, uh, it's a little bit more than the Mirai, uh, a little bit less than Clarity, so all these products have a uh, very competitive power level. Uh, and then when you look at maximum torque, which is how that car takes off and push it to stop sign, is uh, even better. So our executive vice chairman, Yusan Chung, has announced a major initiative within our Hyundai Motor Group companies around the world. Uh, he wants to provide 700,000 fuel cells annually by 2030. Now that's 500,000 for vehicles and 200,000 for stationary sources like uh, grid storage or for uh, decarbonizing you know, power uh, buildings and homes. So this is a big, ambitious goal for our company, and we're basically all in, and that's one of the key messages to say for investment in this area. So you can imagine where you can go with it. So of course, uh, we want to decarbonize all modes of movement. So whether it's forklift, uh, trains, uh, vessels, uh, automobiles, uh, stationary power generation, uh, all of these areas are areas we're trying to become a participant in. And I believe we're in, either we are the largest shipbuilder in the world or maybe the second largest. So we certainly are well invested in the shipbuilding industry. Uh, all the Metrolink trains right here in LA and Orange County, those are all Hyundai trains. If you check on one, you can check the plant as you walk in. 
So we're fairly heavily invested in the training business as well. So uh, we're working very closely with our partners to find hydrogen power solutions for these vehicles and power packs as well. So when you think about our roadmap, you know, we have our first mass-produced vehicle in 1998, I'm, I'm sorry, 2013, and then uh, we moved on with Nexo now with a tremendous amount of uh, capability even beyond our Genesis luxury vehicles. Uh, as we move forward, uh, we're going to be thinking about and moving towards commercial vehicles. That's really our direction now because commercial vehicles have a lot of advantages. We're not limited by infrastructure because many of the commercial fleets are centrally refueled. So we can deploy much more quickly uh, with those. So we're very uh, uh, in the investigation stages now, looking at what we can do with the commercial vehicle side. So, uh, and again, as I mentioned uh, several times, uh, commercial vehicles have a tremendous advantage when you think about uh, hydrogen for those vehicles in terms of range, refueling time, and of course, uh, capability in terms of payload and volume. Very similar to diesel vehicles. Uh, and so uh, already we've had uh, commercial buses in uh, service. Uh, the 2006 Soccer World Cup in Germany, 2018 Winter Olympics in Korea. We had a fleet of Nexos at the 2018 Winter Olympics in Korea. They were also driving autonomously during that period, moving uh, VIPs and customers in and out of the uh, Olympic Village area. So, uh, a number of business partners. You may have read the papers recently. We just signed an agreement with Audi. Uh, we're partnering in terms of sharing our hydrogen technology with Audi to allow them to advance their electric vehicle development here in hydrogen. Uh, also, Air Liquide and Engie, we're partnering with them in terms of infrastructure development to help in that area. And uh, we're helping in uh, mobility in other ways as well. So, just a quick summary. Uh, we think uh, fuel cell will play a very important role in the future. Uh, it's compatible with that, with that, although in the case of that, we don't believe that it will replace all vehicles in, the, in this room today, but hydrogen can. But battery electric will serve a very important role with smaller class vehicles. Uh, we'll continue to demonstrate a long-term term commitment. I think I've shown that earlier today uh, with the future vehicles and other solutions for uh, storage and stationary power. And we'll continue to look at ways to grow our sales level. Uh, we're going to continually focus on cost reduction. That's, again, the final stage of our need for this type of fuel. And we're going to try and uh, invest in the right ways in terms of uh, building awareness and consideration with our customers uh, to consider these products as we move forward. So we've done a number of innovative things. For example, we offer uh, three years of free fuel for these vehicles so customers aren't worried about the cost of fuel. We're doing a number of different things to make sure we eliminate barriers for adoption for those earlier adopters that, that the professor did mention earlier. We're trying to close the chasm, so to speak. Uh, and so uh, we're working very closely with government as well to make sure that uh, our actions are uh, clear and our intents are clear so we can partner well with government in terms of trying to preserve uh, things that will help customers adopt more quickly. So that's all I have today. Thank you. So, Brian, thank you. Hyundai has come a long way. I remember in 86 when I watched my first Hyundai commercial. 10-year, 10, 10 100,000 mile warranty. Nobody wanted to drive it going now. You know, Hyundai has come a long way. Is it Hyundai or Hyundai? How do you pronounce it? Hyundai. I was, I was testing you because I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, like <laughs> so, I'm very, as a Korean American, I'm very proud that Hyundai is, is winning so many awards. Um, it's good things to hear. Good thing to hear. Um, next speaker, last but not least, Mr. Jordan Kemper. He's the Vice President of Sales and Business Development at Golden Gate Zero Emission Marine. He has a background in entrepreneurship, product management, management consulting, and direct sales. His focus is on commercializing hydrogen fuel cells for the commercial maritime market. Please come up and let's hear your presentation. So why marine? Uh, so there's really two principal reasons. One of them is environmental and health related. Marine is a filthy, filthy industry. Uh, if you look at global shipping as an example, uh, it would be the sixth largest country as far as contributing to greenhouse gases. And that's not even talking about the rest of the marine fleet, harbor craft, passenger vessels, uh, offshore supply, 
and a range of other types of marine assets. Uh, the other thing is, it's not just greenhouse gases. We're talking about diesel particulates, NOx and sulfur. Uh, these are very dirty fuels in very dirty vessels. The other thing is, uh, marine is, is not widely understood, uh, understood by many within the transportation market, uh, but it does unlock a lot of potential for general commercialization of hydrogen fuel cell technology, uh, mainly on the infrastructure and fueling side, given the large demand for hydrogen that these vessels have. Uh, so quick background, uh, we are a hydrogen fuel cell powertrain company. Our business is to build power systems for the commercial marine fleet of all sizes. Modular from a couple hundred uh, kilowatts all the way to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 megawatt power systems. Uh, our founder is from a DOE lab, uh, Dr. Joseph Pratt, one of the world's leading experts in hydrogen fuel cell technology and commercialization. So maritime, historically, if you go uh, thousands of years back, uh, the fuel was wind. Uh, there was no regulation, there were no emissions. And uh, once we moved to combustion, we started using this filthy, filthy bunker fuel, uh, which is about the dirtiest type of uh, fuel really utilized. Uh, and the IMO stepped in, uh, and this, the first regulation was back in 1997. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but the, the key takeaway is the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, has been creating increasingly strict regulations on the marine fleet with the uh, increasing speed. So legislation is coming faster and faster, uh, as is the, the stringency of these policies. So you know we're getting cleaner diesel engines, uh, we're getting cleaner fuels. Uh, however, uh, one of the, the places that we're looking at is eventually carbon is going to be uh, a major target once the sulfur and the NOx and the particulate emissions are down. And LNG, which is a proposed solution for a lot of these larger applications, will not solve that problem. So uh, a lot of this was already covered. Uh, it, really, the problem is exacerbated when you look at the marine fleet. Uh, basically, batteries are, are not a competitor. There's a great application here for high power short range. The uh, problem is, once you get to longer range applications, you just don't have the energy density. So it's a, it's a product of both the form factor uh, of the whole system, uh, the weight of the system, as well as the energy density uh, of the storage system, so a battery, versus a uh, hydrogen fuel tank. The global maritime market is massive. Uh, it's, again, something that's often overlooked. Uh, we've got harbor craft, fishing vessels, passenger vessels, offshore supply, construction vessels, uh, cruise ships, uh, and cargo and container vessels. Uh, right now, we're excited to say we are in conversations with uh, operators on every single uh, frontier of the marine fleet, looking at electrifying using hydrogen. And I want to take a moment here to talk about the commercialization uh, potential that hydrogen unlocks. If you look at a passenger car, uh, a hydrogen fuel cell car, you're looking at about 0.6 kilograms per day. People don't drive their cars all day. Uh, they, uh, they don't even drive them every day. Uh, a lot of the duty cycles on these vessels can be 18 hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. These are used frequently. Uh, so in, in even going up to commercial, uh, automobile, but we're looking at a, a transit bus uh, or a dray, class eight, or whatever. Uh, it could be around 50 kilograms a day, plus or minus, depending on the application. Just looking at a, a high-speed ferry, uh, right there. This could be Rita. This could be you know any any catamaran around the world. We're looking at 1,200 kilograms a day, over a ton of hydrogen a day. So when California is saying, hey, by 2025, we want to have 80,000 fuel cell electric vehicles on the road. And in order to do that, we need about 120 fueling stations to support 500, uh, 500 kilograms a day capacity. When you're looking at $3 million per station, that's $360 million in infrastructure to support that, 80,000 vessels. And I think today we're talking about millions of vessels. It's a lot of money. Uh, the equivalency would be 60 harbor craft, 60. And with the same standpoint of the commercial automotive fleet, it's all centralized. It's working on a port of Long Beach or LA or Oakland, right? The best part is we don't need any infrastructure. We need to be scaling fuel supply to lower the costs. 
However, we can fuel these vessels directly from the dock like they do with diesel presently by driving a truck. So it's much easier on early adopter. Uh, the consumer is not a factor. You don't have a pickle consumer. You have a, a, a heavy commercial use, which is a consistent high volume demand for hydrogen. There's a lot of benefits. Um, we all understand the zero emission side. Uh, it's a solid state power system. Fuel cells have no moving parts except for the compressor or the air blower. So maintenance requirements are much simpler. Uh, you're also using electric motors for jet propulsion. But generally speaking, we're looking at 20 to 50% uh, lower reduction in replacement parts and maintenance expenditure. That's massive. Uh, that's, that's pretty profound. Uh, this was talked about with auto, uh, but basically you have the same operational flexibility. Right? So you can fuel up and go. You don't need to charge. You don't need to build charging infrastructure. You have a lot of that flexibility that diesel will afford to. Um, and because we have solid state electric drive, it supports autonomy, autonomous operations, uh, which is a major point of interest for the shipping market in particular. How can we create global autonomous shipping to lower their operating expenses? So a uh, quick plug on the company. We're building one of the first fuel cell commercial vessels in the world. Uh, depends on how you define a commercial vessel. Uh, this will be actually on the water at the end of this year. Uh, it's a project which is uh, done in cooperation with CARB and the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Uh, it's a 22 knot, uh, 360 kilowatt uh, fuel cell system with 100 kilowatt hours of lithium ion batteries. We're using compressed gas in this case. Though it's important to note that due to the energy requirements in the marine space, liquid hydrogen or other denser methods of storage, liquid organic characters, uh, carriers, uh, or producing hydrogen either way, uh, are going to be required in order to support the, the operational profiles. This is being built in Alameda, up in the Bay Area. And I'm excited to say I put this in here knowing that the press release would come out today. Uh, this was confidential information. You're one of the first people to probably hear about it. We have officially sold the vessel, uh, thus uh, fully commercializing the asset. Uh, and even more exciting, the partner, we have a, a contract to build the whole fleet of them. Uh, so we will be building more ferries. Uh, we will be building offshore supply vessels. Uh, and this is a, a singular partner uh, of many that we're speaking with. Uh, so we're really excited uh, that you know, the CARB and Bay Area Management District and our technology partners, uh, BAE, Hydrogenics, and other people uh, have, have really helped get this on the water and show that it is possible. Here's a list of our partners. And that's all. And we have this show uh, and O'Brien, uh, Progressive Man, come forward for Q&A, very short Q&A. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Or are we just hungry? <laughs> no questions? Okay, there's one question in the back. Uh, red. Red, 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 red dress. Oh, can you just, uh, can you stand up, introduce yourself, and ask a question? Any other questions? In the audience? There's one question from Mr. David Park.
Fisher. Your name and uh, business you belong to. Hi, uh, my name is Nisha. So uh, I just want to understand how the investments has to be pushed towards uh, EV and hydrogen, uh, how it has to be split to push the market. Right now, uh, the government or uh, the investment people are uh, towards EV, so how it has to be split towards hydrogen to push the market. How do you think? That's a great question. Uh, so every big company, whether it's Mercedes Benz or Ford or General Motors, uh, they have limited resources. So we have we have about roughly around 10,000 engineers at our main engineering center outside of Seoul. We have hundreds more at our engineering center in Detroit. Uh, but nonetheless, there's not enough engineers to go around for every project. So we have to prioritize how much we're going to spend in various areas of R&D, and, and we're making a bet for the future. So uh, we are a little different than other companies. Other companies have focused on one technology, and we've been able to, uh, I dare say, maybe a more of a peanut butter tech uh, approach. Meaning, we're invested in uh, plug-in hybrids. We're invested in hybrids, obviously in batteries to power both. We're invested in battery electric vehicles, but we really focus more of our efforts compared to other makers on hydrogen. So a lot of makers are, are by necessity, by regulation. They have to invest in hybrid technology. Uh, plug in hybrid, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but hydrogen has been uh, something only a few makers have invested in, and we've decided to invest, uh, over invest in that area because we feel like it's today the only fuel that can displace all vehicles on the road, not just some vehicles on the road. So that's really been the background of why we've over invested here in hydrogen. But your question is great. We, we've invested in all of them, and uh, we have very good partners in Korea. Partners, whether it's for electric motors or batteries, uh, as well as hydrogen. So uh, we're, we're trying to spread our bet as best we can, thinking that there's never not going to be a clear winner. Just like today, we see diesel and gasoline uh, uh, coexist together uh, in a friendly way. Uh, there could easily be an energy economy in the future where there's not going to be one. Uh, there's going to be fuels that are going to be uh, more beneficial for some customers than others. If I live in my own home and I have uh, they, uh, I have a variable rate uh, electricity. Uh, I could maybe benefit more with a better, small battery electric vehicle if I can charge it in my garage. Uh, if I drive a lot and I go on a lot of trips, uh, I'm sure it'll be better. So there's going to be a role for both. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, a level of penetration for both in the future. So uh, our bet right now is to have a little bit of everything. One, one last question. Can I piggyback off that really quickly? Uh, I, when you look at that, that that's a, a very valuable Say fuel cell next cell speed. It was there last month. Was it? <laughs> Did move it? So we, we do rotate those fans. Yeah. And I, I will tell you they have a little bit of news too. We, uh, I'll look forward to that. There will be a commercial hybrid <coughs> station opening up a couple of blocks away from our uh, headquarters. Uh, it is, I'm not sure how fast the construction will go, but it's, uh, it's going to move quickly. It's all been approved now. So, so uh, we'll now have a, a hydrogen fuel station in the top I don't know why, but this thing. Reminds me of ESPN post game press conference. <laughs> so, one last question to end the day Toronto or Golden State? Uh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. I know we can smell the lunch from here. Uh, but before we end it, let's give a big round of applause for the speaker.
And uh, I have just one announcement. Uh, this was our first, when I say our, this Korean American Energy Association's first symposium. So I know we had some shortcomings, we didn't know what to do with the mics and stage. So I hope you understand. But we do have an application. If you are interested in joining this organization, there's an application in the front. And I believe the membership fee is $300. And if you want to be uh, connected with this organization, please drop your business card in the basket in the back. And I would like to give the podium to uh, Chairman Joseph King for his final remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to add one uh, important business tip uh, to whom uh, interest with the uh, hydrogen business industry. Uh, already so many things were uh, in, in the hydrogen economy, but I want to strongly recommend one uh, in this case is the uh, forklift, hydrogen forklift. If uh, there are some uh, small and medium companies here, uh, I want to do the, some hydrogen uh, business, then I recommend the hydrogen forklift because hydrogen forklift already adopted in the market. Right now, two, more than 20,000 hydrogen forklifts were deployed in the United States. Also Walmart and uh, also the Amazon, they announced they will change all their forklifts from hydrogen forklifts. Also, in the near future, uh, by 2030, in forklift market, more than 60% will be the hydrogen forklift. So forklift market is not comparing with the uh, traditional food uh, market, but it is excellent market for the small and medium companies. Okay, as a chairman of KAEA, thank you so much for the uh, key speakers and guest speakers for your excellent uh, expertise and presentations. And also thank you so much for audiences for your uh, valuable participations. I hope see you in next energy symposium. Thank you so much. Hi. Uh, so I wanna think uh, some uh, make a history. So uh, we wanna invite you to, to take a photo all together with uh, speakers and the uh, guest speakers. And Hamnaki, can you take a photo for this one? So.